Hello all Happiness Egg Shape listeners and watchers, this is the Happiness Is podcast with me your host Bruce Aitchison, brought to you in association with Infinity Blue. They can look after you whether it is a checkup, teeth whitening or a more complicated procedure. Give them a call, get in touch and they will look after you to make sure that you keep that smile intact because after all, they know, we know, I know, you know, Happiness Is Egg Shaped. Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison, and I'm really excited about this one. Uh, I don't know today's guest that well uh, because I'm old. I know his dad far too well, uh, and if he's anything like his old man, he'll definitely have a story to tell. I'm really excited about this because this guy's a wanderer. Uh, he's wandered to some of the places that I've been to, which makes me even more interested in it. Uh, it's been an unconventional journey, but he looks pretty happy to me. And I think a lot of us would be pretty jealous of where he is at the moment. Maybe not right this second, but where he's going to be playing his rugby. Let's not waste any more time and bring in the one and the only, the young and the handsome, Mr. Josh Henderson. Hello, sir. Hi, mate. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, It's class. Uh, So (laughs) at the moment you're back home in Scotland because it's obviously off-season, but you've been playing your rugby in San Diego. Now, if you're a rugby fan, you know that, rugby in the states is going but there will be some people going he what he plays rugby in san diego but then when you start to look deeper into what rugby in san diego is it looks pretty cool how happy are you with that gig yeah do you know what um i think i've definitely landed on my feet with that gig it's um it's pretty phenomenal and like you said i think a lot of people are kind of unaware with how big the league is how big that team is like how popular the team is um and, and kind of the direction of where rugby's going in america is hugely exciting times in america you know there's 12 pro teams at the moment um across america with with i know the plans are to add two every year uh to the to the competition so um obviously getting to see some beautiful parts of the of uh america one of them being san diego where i live which is uh you know i, I literally have nothing to complain about living there it's pretty awesome yeah, I, I can understand that. Now, I'm always intrigued by this bit. How do you end up in San Diego? Is it an agent? Is it a mate? Is it you pushing yourself? How did you end up <coughs> at San Diego? So when I came out of the um, Sevens um, in Scotland, I ended up uh, taking up a contract in Hong Kong. Um, now, my mum's actually half Hong Kong Chinese, which makes me qualify for their national team. So at the time, pre-COVID or kind of during COVID, they're their 15s and 7s were, were full-time and um, were a full-time program so I signed up a couple of year contract over there to go and play um, things didn't really work out rugby wise um, over there for the two years I was there I only played like four games just 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 through COVID and things like that but I met a guy there who was the head coach at Hong Kong Football Club and one of the, the coaches in the Hong Kong Rugby Union a guy Jack Wiggins who at the end of that two years where I'd literally hadn't played rugby in uh, literally about a year um, he ended up getting um, the defence coach job at San Diego. And at the back end of their season last year, um, one of their 10s got injured and they were kind of like, well, we need a guy that can come in um, ASAP and is going to be keen. And he kind of just gave me a ring or Danny Lee, the head coach, gave me a ring and just asked if I fancied it to come in for the last couple of games and, and just see what happens. Um, so I was like, bit his hand off. I was like, absolutely, I'll come. He asked me if I was fit. I said, yes, definitely wasn't. Um, turned up. <laughs> Played two games, um, did all right, um, and then they offered me a, a three plus one off the back of it. So I'm um, hugely happy to be there. And, and um, obviously, like I said, um, landed on my feet. But um, I think it's kind of a network to network kind of thing. You know, <laughs> I managed to meet a guy in, in Hong Kong that ended up getting a good gig and, and decided to take me with, with him. So it was, it was really cool. I've got, right. got, a lot of, uh, got a lot of gratitude towards Jack for that. Right, let, let's rewind a little bit there then, that <coughs> networking bit. So luck might be something you believe in or not, I don't know. Fate is something I don't believe in in any way. But you put yourself in a situation where that kind of thing can happen. So you were in Scotland, you go to Hong Kong on the chance of something happening and then actually out of it comes something you could never have planned. Are you, are you always open to... That kind of thing, just up sticks and away I go. Absolutely, I think 
um, it's one of the main reasons I say I stay single, you know, uh, just need to worry about myself. <laughs> so I think, uh, I think, yeah, I'm always, I'm, I've definitely recently always been kind of keen to just get up and, and do it, have a crack. Like I spent the off season last year in, in Australia and Sydney playing in the Shoot Shield. Absolutely loved that. Um, and it's yeah, I, lo- I love the the freedom side of things to just kind of go and and use rugby to travel the world, meet new people, um, live for free in most places. You know, it, it's pretty cool. So um, yeah, I'm more than open to that. But to be honest, I'm, it's going to be pretty hard to drag me away from where I am now. I, I won't lie. Yeah, though no, three plus one that that plus is uh, pretty positive for you. I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, like I, I originally I was. Um, pretty surprised because i only played two games um but i just i just think that uh, again the coaches obviously have a little bit of faith in me and and they want to build like a brand and, and build a really successful team in san diego so i think doing that's kind of one of the most important things for that is having continuity in your squad so um i'm just thankful to be a part of it that's a pretty mature outlook to have they want to build a brand which means it takes time which means you got to tie people in for that length of time so there's obviously a demand on you more off the field then if they're trying to make the brand and try and make the team bigger do you enjoy that bit of the the gig massively um the the american the way the americans do sport um i think is you know in my opinion something that rugby needs right now like they need that passionate almost like a lot of my mates that watch the games and people from um you know the uk that watch the games australia they, they find it a little bit cringe but i actually think it's awesome and i think like it's really grown on me and i think that generally that rugby could do with a bit of that you know a little bit extra energy next to games and the way they they hype up games the way they market games the way they market players like there's a real there's a real avenue for players to become their own brand as well out in america which is hugely exciting um, and that just comes down to their kind of culture around sport. Um, and like I said, I think a lot of uh, rugby cultures around the world could take a lot from America right now and the way they're doing things. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about where it's going. No, it, it looks amazing. And certainly, you know, social media is not the best window into what life looks like, but hmm. it certainly looks decent from the, the, the way I'm looking at it. You've got a couple of pretty high profile teammates. I do, yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah. What, one of them taking you under his wing, if I believe your old man's stories. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm assuming you're talking about Ma. Um, he's obviously, in my opinion, to be honest, I said this before I even went there and ended up playing with him, which, to be honest, even now I have some surreal moments where I'm a bit like, what's going on? Um, but he's a, a hugely competitive guy, hugely professional. Um, I've learned a huge amount from him. And, yeah, he does take time with me to go over clips. Obviously, we play 10 and 12 together quite a bit um to go over clips and he just doesn't he just doesn't bat around the bush he's very straight up and straightforward with what he wants from you and and it, it doesn't doesn't leave you guessing when you've done something wrong either so it's uh, it's good to have a guy like that but also off the field he's he's like one of the young boys like he loves to have a laugh and and take the, take the piss and yeah he's awesome he's really good to have around and he's 41 years old but i think he's going to go again so um looking forward to that fingers crossed he must realize that he's playing with people who watched him on TV and, you know, watched him do some incredible things. But he strikes me from very far away as a pretty humble character. Super humble. And, like, I, I've, like, obviously a lot of the boys at the club are a bit, when they first meet him, and he plays on it a little bit, which I think is hilarious. Like, he, he knows the boys, obviously know who he is and know what he's done and all that. But once you're, like, like comfortable and you're, and you're like, kind of close, spent a bit of time together, He's more than open and happy to have those conversations about all those like kind of cringy questions you want to ask. Um, so like you know he's 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 very good guy to have around the squad for all the young boys. He, he loves spending time with the young boys as well. You know, I had a couple of weekends where we were getting rested, we weren't playing. We we'd head and play golf, or we'd go and do some like recovery together, which is a massive thing. He's kind of introduced me to just like the more professional side of things in terms of how how I analyze games, how I analyze opposition, but also like have a look after my body. He's, uh, there's, it's no coincidence that he's still playing at the level he is at 42, you know, or 41. And he's got like a 72 hour recovery protocol that he's done for the last 20 years. And it, it obviously works. So um, it's been awesome to just kind of watch and learn from him and, and listen to him and ask him endless questions. So uh, yeah, it's cool. 
So talk me through a bit then of of America because there's a, an uneducated view. Man on who's gone there, end his career because America's kind of easy going and you know, nice <coughs> world in San Diego. There will be American players who are desperate to become professionals and possibly pick up a contract overseas. There's guys like yourself who are not quite man on who, but you're adding a huge amount to the, the franchise with your experience and your level of play. What what is the driver? Are are those guys fully invested in San Diego? They're playing for the shirt. They understand how important it is to build the brand. Or do you feel like they're looking for a move to a bigger league? Um, so I think, do you know what? I think a lot of guys, um, you know, the more experienced guys, obviously we had like Blair Cowan there. We had another couple of ex-All Blacks, Isaac Ross, Tom Franklin there this year as well. That were They're all super experienced guys. And yeah, they are coming to the end of their career. But they still want to play competitive rugby and they want to play at a level where it's not, you know, um, like semi-professional or anything like that. They, a lot of these guys that are playing in the league that are not American, etc. that a lot of them are ITM cup players or ex super rugby players. And the level's very, it's getting compared a lot by those guys to the ITM cup. That's kind of the level that you're looking at. Um, San Diego has an outfit from the boys that played it. They probably said we'd probably finish about mid table there. So there, there's kind of an idea on the, on the level. Um, so like I said, I think what a lot of people see as well, the games they watch, like I'm just going to be pretty honest here, like there's some really average teams in the league, but then there's like five or six really good teams that would be competitive in most of the leagues in the world. Now that's probably seems quite, you know, aggressive to say, but um, that's coming from guys that have played in those leagues as well. And that's not coming from me. So um, I'm, again, I think the, the thing that America has, it's got that attraction of the lifestyle it's got that attraction of the seven month season, six, seven month season as well. So for boys' bodies, you know, you get five months off a year that prolongs your career, prolongs your amount of time you can make income for your family. Um, just little things like that. But um, like I know this off season, San Diego has been getting hounded with, with some pretty big names trying to come and play for us. But um, it's not as simple as that now because you're only allowed 10 non-American or Canadian players and you're 23. So you've got to be careful about how many international guys you, you, you um, recruit. So last season, um, well, I'll I'll just throw it to you. How did last season go? And are you able to look at it more objectively now that you've got a bit of distance from it? <clears throat> yeah, obviously, um, I'm a I, I just want to win. So we and we didn't do that. So it's it still stings a little bit. But we did. I suppose if you want to take the positive out of every situation, kind of thing, we we did set records um, in terms of wins and and um, wins on the trot. Um, but we lost to a team that we'd already beaten early on in the season. And was it complacency? To be honest, probably. Um, we probably turned up thinking we just need to turn up more and we'll, we'll get the job done. Um, but I think that's like the kind of the amount of leaders and like guys we've got on our team that have been through that hundreds of times. Like it was almost like the week after we met as a, as a team and it's like, look, um, yeah, look what's happened, happened. We can't change it, but like they've created a beast now. Like, and, and that's kind of the the thing I was talking about about a brand as well, and creating that continuity. That like maybe this is what we needed to go through this year to become that team that wins five, six, seven championships on the trot. You know, that 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 must be massively exciting to be part of. Yeah, hugely. Like, um, I you know, I, there's there's definitely been a part of me for a while that's thought about look I want to go and play and, and kind of try and come back here one day and, and play professionally in Scotland but um, you know there, there's there's um, a part of me now that I'm just like I'm, I'm pretty happy where I am and I'm looking at like kind of my career and where it could go there and I'm hugely excited and um, I'm you know I've, I've got no no qualms about staying there and, and trying to just be super successful every year so yeah. That sounds exciting. Uh, I certainly hope it happens for you. Let's rewind all the way back. So you kind of touched on it there. 16-year-old Josh um, could never have planned what's happened. And mm. and I love that. And you've already touched on it a little bit that, you know, you're a pretty free spirit and you have kit bag, will travel idea. What what was the ambition for 16-year-old Josh? Yeah, obviously I wanted to play for Scotland. I wanted to play for, for Glasgow, play for Scotland and, and do all that. And I think, you know, at one point in time, I was, I was pretty close to breaking into uh, at Glasgow and, um, 
you know, things went the way they went, but I think that's kind of taken to me, taking me where I am today. So I'm, I'm pretty grateful for, um, for where I've ended up. And, um, I think those experiences taught me a lot. Um, so like I said, I, I'm real happy where I am, but, um, you know, yeah, I think I'm just trying to do my best for San Diego now and, and, uh, play some good rugby and enjoy my life. So, you know, you've been doing a bit of coaching while you've been back in Scotland this summer. Um, there'll be a heap of kids who probably had no idea that San Diego had a rugby team and you could be a professional rugby player in America. With Scotland only having two pro teams, that dream that you've just spoken about there is the dream of probably 90% of the kids playing rugby in Scotland at the moment. But there's a huge number of people who are doing other things like you and you've just said Mm -hmm. you're happy. How important is that over that status and kind of ego trip of playing in Scotland in front of everyone where it's in the news and under people's noses, it's on social media? How much is there a trade-off between that happiness you're feeling at the moment and maybe that ambition that you had? Yeah, I think for me, it's it's kind of um, like I said to a couple of them and I've said to a couple of young boys at the school, I'm like, look, if if you're not it's it's super hard to to kind of crack it in scotland and you are re- relying on a little bit of luck sometimes you know to make in scotland there's so many good rugby players um still in scotland now that could probably put on glasgow and shirt, even a scotland shirt that aren't professional rugby players just because there's only two teams you know and it's it's and you've kind of got a very short window to break into that team otherwise they're going to invest in somebody younger and, and cheaper that's just the, it's the business of it and you know that's it's just the reality um, so I've said to them that look, look, you're if you were trying to get if you want to be a professional rugby player in a place that's very well marketed, very well supported. Um, you know, going back, I think we averaged around eight thousand people a game this year. Um, so that's 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 a good start, you know, for where we're at. Um, and I know our marketing team are working harder and harder to to get us above that ten k average every week. So um, the support base is is only going to grow. And I've said to these young kids, I'm like, look, it's it's an avenue you should look at because if you're close over here and you go over to america at the age of 18 you're going to be one of the best players in the country which would get you into a d1 college and after four years you'll be one year away from qualifying for america which makes you very attractive to any mlr team and by that time you're probably looking at about 20 mlr teams in the country um so you you know you've got a pretty good chance of becoming a professional rugby player um, and having a good education and having a great lifestyle whereas over here you could be battling out with loads of guys with the same goal and sometimes you're even relying on just people getting injured uh, is kind of going to be the way your life goes sometimes, you know, which is, which is pretty scary. You've got a lot more control, I think, in, in America where you're going to be a top talent. <laughs> You've done a pretty good sales job there. <laughs> <laughs> Fancy. That, 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 was a, that was a decent pitch. Uh, well, <laughs> back, to, back in the olden days, I went and played in what was the major league before it was like this for the Albany Knickerbockers. Uh, Many, many happy days up there. Many happy days up there. So you're you're in Scotland. You then disappear to Hong Kong, qualifying for Hong Kong. Uh, yeah. Small place, but rugby is <coughs> a big deal there. You probably didn't see it in the best of light because you were there during COVID. But you must have made, and it led to San Diego, you must have made some incredible contacts there. Yeah, massively. And I, I really, I didn't go to university or anything. I went straight into the academy in the uh, out of school so um i didn't go to university or anything but i made some great networking contacts um in hong kong picked up a job in for an alternative assets fund that i've been doing um, and i still do now to this day so like when when rugby stopped i was kind of sitting on my hands a little bit and, and didn't know what to do so a lot of us kind of got and kind of looked into getting other jobs and just working alongside and it was awesome like that two years really opened up my eyes to a completely different world um and the way i thought around you know just simple things like investing your money and things like that it's it's a thing that people talk about a lot there whereas people for me growing up me and my mates never talked about that kind of thing we were just talking about rugby and going out and that was literally it um not very much else so i've like obviously built a really great friendship group in hong kong are all still there and um, some of them have moved away some of them are still there and i've got family there as well so um it's a place that i hold like pretty close to my heart like i, I love i love my time in hong kong um but it's just weird how things worked out that i went there for rugby but kind of left uh not doing much rugby but learning a hell of a lot more which was which is pretty awesome so travel has really broadened your horizon 
massively. I think, um, including Scotland, I think I've lived in six different countries now. I'm 25, so um, and all of those all of those countries, I've not paid my own way to get there. I've not paid for accommodation, so I've I managed to saw something out and it's good good thing rugby you know just free travel agent um but no nah, it's good it's, it's been good and i've and i've loved kind of immersing myself in all these different cultures and um, you know australia for shoot shield was, was semi-professional but what a culture like just around like the whole like even though people look at rugby union and competing with rugby league yeah rugby league is massive and i do kind of wish i played it in oz because it was it's so cool but um just the way they do things you know you could you turn up at the club at 9 30 a.m I was playing first grade, but you turn up at 9.30 a.m., watch the fourth grade, watch the third grade, watch the Colts, watch the second grade, and then they all stay and clap you out, watch you, and then everyone goes to the bar after. Like, it's awesome. I loved it. And I think if I didn't have this gig in San Diego, that's where I would be 100%. They are Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> You've got Come options. On. You've definitely uh, got options. Uh, yeah. So rugby's been that almost that passport, that ticket to ride, and, and you've that's taken right. it. Um, and you, you talk about those cultures. So 18-year-old Josh, confident enough to walk into any changing room in the world and go for it? Or was it the thing that was kind of forced on you by going to Hong Kong? Was there a big maturity jump when you went to Hong Kong? Yeah, I think I think it's probably my confidence probably stems from like the environment I'm in. Like I obviously, I wouldn't wander into like, a Glasgow first team change room at 18 thinking I own the place um but I think I, I definitely kind of wanted to show I mean when I when I arrived in Hong Kong I definitely wanted to show that I'd like played at a decent level and and um I wanted to try and lead that team and there was big goals with that team at the time you know to try and qualify for the World Cup but the things just happened the way they did with COVID and stuff the whole program got shut down and lots of players left and that's just the way things happen but um I was yeah you know pretty confident going in there that with the players that they had at the time and the squad like we actually could have done something pretty special and um, so it was a shame things turned out the way they did but um i think confidence comes from preparation so if i'm prepared then i'm pretty confident but yeah and that preparation for possible after rugby probably took a bigger jump in hong kong because of the situation yeah massively i've got um tons of connections now that you know, there are close mates that have kind of, they've already said to me, look, when, you, when you're when you done playing, come come back, I've got a job for you. So, and um, that takes a bit of pressure off as well, which is great, <laughs> you know. Uh, another good thing that came out of Hong Kong. Was the skills that you have in rugby position, you play communication, organisation, the preparation you've, you've mentioned, not just physical, but the mental preparation, the understanding. Is it now easier to just apply those to you know, a business setting or a professional setting, do you feel that that's been helpful? Massively. All those ones you mentioned and also like the kind of not being scared to get things wrong. Like I think that comes across in this, in the way I play. I'm not afraid to try things and and I kind of back my skill set to, to pull them off. Um, obviously it's within within reason and as I'm maturing as a player, it's understanding like the momentum of the game and when to do these things. But um, that comes to me for business and, and things like that. If you're working in a, in a new sector or you're working with a new client or whatever it's, it's kind of not being embarrassed to ask questions and admit you're wrong and, or take on feedback and things like that like that's that's how that's the only way you're going to get better and get things right so that was another thing i kind of balanced up and compared all right let, let me dig deeper in that one then because asking questions and maybe not knowing everything could be perceived as a weakness uh, if you're playing the position you're playing and you're asking questions to me, that's a positive, but to others, that might be a, how come this guy doesn't know? How? Where did you learn that? How quickly did you learn that? I learned that. Um, I actually learned that in, in, in San Diego from Mata because when I was there, I had the same perception as you, kind of, this guy knows everything, but he asks the most questions out of anyone. Um, and he's still learning. And I was like, wow, like this is crazy. And he even asked me stuff which is also like, I think he, his big thing is like, right, everyone sees the game differently and whichever team kind of understands each other and how they see the game is the best team because that's how, then you can react quicker to situations. You can almost preempt situations, like things like that. Like he's a super deep thinker about the game and to think that he probably, he was a, he was a leader when he was in the All Blacks, but he wasn't like, 
one of the main game drivers and you can just kind of think how deeply those game drivers must be thinking as well so it's it, look it's been awesome to learn from him and like on and off the field um and that's one of the things he's kind of instilled in me is uh, is the whole like kind of thinking and, and analyzing within the game and, and within training because look obviously you're not asking these questions during a game but if you if you are or you're thinking that you need to ask those questions during a game you've, and you've just because you've not had the courage to ask it and and it, during training and then you're you're letting your teammates down that's the way i look at it and um, i just don't want to let my teammates down so if i'm a 10 and i've got a question about somebody's running line or or somebody's cue on, on whatever it is um i better not be asking that during a game or or two minutes before about to run a play i need to be asking that on the wednesday the thursday before a game not 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 during a game or in the team run that's when you get slapped by man on it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you want that. I love that that no. everybody's seeing the game differently, so you can yeah, learn absolutely. learn from that. If you if you know better what twelve is seeing, that's going to help you at, at ten inside them. That that's a really nice way to put it. So that Aussie experience, um, that that wasn't really a, a grand plan, was it? That was a uh, just an opportunity, <coughs> a, a place to spend some time. Yeah, so I literally, when I finished up in San Diego, um, the head coach, the coach was kind of like, look, because when I when I arrived, I think it was 10 months I'd play, I hadn't played a game when I first, but I arrived in San Diego and they were like, oh, by the way, you're starting this weekend. So I was like, oh, okay, here we go. And they were like, don't worry, Ma's outside you. So I was like, well, who? <laughs> it's a funny, I have a laugh with Danny about it all the time because I'm like, well, do I call make the calls or does he call it? And he just laughs and he's like, you'll call it, but he'll help you out. Um, and I was like, what is going on? I haven't played in like, like almost a year. And now I'm playing with Mars. So was, that was weird. But after that season, he, um, Danny and the coach were just like, look, um, we, we want you to go and play some more rugby, like get some more rugby under your belt. Like you should go to Oz and things like that. And I was, it was already kind of in the back of my mind. One of my best mates lives out there. And he was kind of at me to come out. So went out there for kind of the last seven games, played for Northern Suburbs in the Shoot Shield. Um, at North Sydney Oval, which was one of the best tracks I've ever played on. It was awesome. Zach Beer, the head coach there, is, is great. And they had a really great bunch of boys. Like, the culture was awesome. Very, very close to going back this year as well for the off-season, but I um, hadn't been home in three years, so mum dragged me home. But, um, look, they're doing, they're doing really well. I think they're in the semis again. We lost in the semis last year, um, but absolutely loved my time there. I did the season and then stayed for another three months before flying back to, to San Diego. So you play in Scotland, you play in Hong Kong a little bit, you play in Aussie, you play in San Diego. There there must be some adaptations you have to make. There's no way that team in North Sydney are playing, you know, playing on that track who are playing the same way as maybe a team in Hong Kong or in Scotland. So has that given, has, have those experiences made you a better player because you've had to make those adaptations? Yeah, I think... It's had it's, it's had it's, it's had its positive and negative. I think with the fluctuation in levels, um, I can't remember the last game I played in Scotland. To be honest, I just remember it was probably cold. Um, but they, they, in terms of Hong Kong, it was definitely more of you'll know yourself. It's more of a social league. Um, like, yeah, I think a great place to go for social rugby and and, and make a bit of money um, and, and, and you know do well in your career and stuff. Um, but that was, I did enjoy that, you know, like I love going back to kind of like the roots of rugby. Cause I think I'd, I, I think in Scotland, I'd started to maybe fall in love with rugby a little bit and it started to become a job too quickly when I was young. Um, whereas that kind of took me back and it was like Tuesday, Thursday nights, like obviously I was training full time with the, the national team, but Tuesday, Thursday nights with some good blokes that just come out of the office, they're there for a bit of fun. They're having beers after training. And like just little things like that. And then you play on the Saturday, you go out and you see everyone you played against. Like, I love that side of things. Um, in terms of the rugby side of things, like I learned a lot about how to like manage my, like manage a forward pack and manage myself in like ridiculously hot weather. Um, like you've got boys going down with full body cramps and you know, some of these guys are working office jobs, they're investment bankers and they're probably in some of the worst shape of their life they'll ever be in and they're still running themselves out on a Saturday in 35 degrees heat and 90% humidity. And I'm like, you boys are mad, but um, yeah, that. And then Sydney was obviously like, when I turned up, it was after the Super Rugby season while the Wallabies were all, uh, playing their like November tests or whatever it was, or autumn tests. And uh, what happens there is they all come down. So all the boys are not playing Wallabies. They're not playing Super Rugby. They all come and play Shoot Shield. So the level goes from here to here for the kind of like the back end of the season. 
and you've got like some really good outfits getting put out. Like I think we played against East and they had 13 Waratahs in their starting 15. Um, so that was like a real good, that was a game that I was like really up for to kind of test myself against that kind of level of, of player. Um, but like, that's what the shoot show is great for. Like the, they, they don't carry subs or anything. So everyone's playing a lot and they've got four teams playing a lot. You've got the guys that are super, they're not playing. They'll drop in and play every week. Um, so it's a super competitive league. Uh, very fast, not as physical, very fast. Um, whereas I'd say in San Diego, if I use the comparison, if we played, you know, us and New England, the two best teams, we play against each other. It's pretty quick, but it's also bloody physical as well. Um, that's probably, it's a, it's a pretty good league um, when you have the two better teams, some of the better teams going up against each other. It's very competitive, fast, physical, and it's a lot of chess as well. Um, a lot of great coaches that are smart, you know, a lot of Kiwi ITM Cup level coaches that have coached Super Rugby and coached in Japan and things like that. They're smart. They know each other. They know their team's tendencies and you've got to come prepared with plan A, B, C. Otherwise, you, you'll get you'll get caught out. You've got a range of experience that very few players in Scotland have got because you've played in those different places and seen, you know, worked with different coaches. There can be a perception here that the Southern Hemisphere has got everything. Um, you know, Super rugby is the best and the big nations in the Southern Hemisphere are better than up here. So you've gone down and you've played against 13 Waratahs and you probably had some in your own team and, you know, you're playing yeah. in San Diego with Ma Nonu. Okay, he's in his 40, but, you know, it's Ma Nonu all the same. Where do you see the the comparison? What is it that's happening differently in these places to Scotland? Is there as big a gulf? <coughs> Where do you see the, the point of difference? Um, I don't know. I've because I've not been here for so long. It's kind of hard for me to comment on that. But I feel like speaking to the boys here, I think it's the, it's the amount of rugby they're playing. I think a lot of boys, like I, I, the big thing I took away in Oz is like lads are just they're playing all the time. Like and obviously they they've got people monitoring their bodies and things like that during the week at training. But they're on the field no matter who. They, like Reese Hodge was playing against the All Blacks, I think, in their first test and last two weeks he's been playing for Manly in the shoot shield. So it's like that kind of thing. Um, like you'd never see, you know, I don't know, a Blair Kinghorn, if he was having, if he wasn't playing for Scotland this weekend and there was Super 6 rugby playing in that, you just wouldn't see it. Um, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just kind of, that's the, the main difference I saw. Um, but in, in terms of America, that my, my big thing uh, with the Americans is how they kind of treat you as like an individual as well as a player. Like, we have got nothing to worry about off the field. Like we're so well looked after in terms of housing, cars, um, you know, our owners are, it's, it's obviously all privately owned. So it's, they've only, they've got a much smaller pool of players to look after, but um, I'm so grateful. And I know all the boys are so grateful to our, 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 um, our owners, you know, every Wednesday, for example, they have the whole team, all the staff um, and everyone's families run to their house for dinner fully, like for obviously for free, but just like little things like that. And it's like, look, out if anyone needs anything, just text me and I've got you. Um, I think for, for the final, he flew out, out everyone's parents and, and families that were that were in that were in America with them and all the kids and everything. Flew them out, paid for their hotels, everything, sorted them out. So there is that real like kind of care and family vibe. And I know it's quite cliche saying that, that you know, having a brotherhood and a team and things like that. But I get like the first environment that I generally felt that. And I generally felt like boys, that we generally really cared about each other. Like, at the end of the day, you're spending... We have, in the seven-month season, we have two weeks, two bye weeks where we get off. That's it. And apart from that, we're back to back to back to back the whole seven months. And it gets intense and people annoy you. And, you know, there's a lot of different cultures in there that boys are... They're... But we really, uh, you know, we really gelled as a group this year. And I think that was one of the main reasons why we're so successful was how special our culture was. Okay, there you go. There's that buzzword culture. So you've seen a few and you've mentioned that sort of brotherhood and looking after each other. If you look into your crystal ball in maybe 10 years time, or if you're like Manonu, for you maybe 15 or 20 years time, can you see yourself becoming a coach and wanting to build a culture around a team? Or do you see yourself moving into sort of professional life? <coughs> I have no idea. Um, I've not really, I've got too long to play to keep thinking about that too much. Um, I think I could see myself going down either route, to be honest. Um, the coaching side of things does intrigue me. I like to work with young fly halves and 
and uh, and older ones as well if they if they want. Uh, I can't. I like to see the way they look at a game, and because you can, you can, the one thing again I was talking about Ma earlier, you can still keep learning from people that don't have as much experience as you. Like you can still see how they see the game and decisions they make and why they make them, and that's a big question. Like he asked me a lot, is why did you do that? Like even if it was right, it's like why did you do that? What did you see? So yeah, I really, I, I really could see myself going down that coaching route, but also could easily see myself going down the professional route. And, and that's one thing I can see a pathway for in America, you know, like something like punditry or podcasts, even like things like that. There's just a massive avenue for it. And I know our owners are big, big um, guys for wanting to grow the game in America. So one of our guys is um, recently retired and I know he's, he's going into some sort of punditry role with, with the league and, and that's been massively backed by our owners. So, um, it's exciting. Again, there's there's not just rugby opportunities in, in America for you if you stay long term. So, yeah, it's cool. I love hearing your enthusiasm. You mentioned that you'd maybe fallen out of love a little bit with rugby when you were still in Scotland. Was that through lack of opportunity or maybe just wanting to play? Where do you think that was coming from? Yeah, I think my year in the sevens, I didn't, I didn't play a single game. Um, I was kind of you know, sevens is tough training and there was guys ahead of me in that squad that would deserve to be ahead of me. They were much better sevens players than me. So I'm not, not for one second saying I should have been playing ahead of them, but I wasn't playing any 15s either, which I found really frustrating. And I just felt like I was kind of coming to a point where I need to be in the shot window and I wasn't getting the opportunity to, to do that. So that was one of the reasons why I, I kind of upped and went to Hong Kong. And um, some people thought it was too early. Um, and, you know, for a while I did as well when everything went the way it went in Hong Kong. I thought, geez, what am I going to do now? I'm going to have to kind of come back to Scotland with my tail between my legs almost. Um, being like, oh, okay, yeah, you were all right. Sorry. Um, but then obviously landed on my feet in San Diego. So thanks. For, thank God for that. <laughs> how do you how do you manage through those situations? You know, it sounds like Josh's life's a bowl of cherries. Um, leave Scotland, goes to Hong Kong, Aussie, San Diego, Santan, Man, Nonu, life's pretty good. But there's tough times too. What what have you learned and how do you get through those? I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite um, laid back and I have a good perspective on like how like lucky I've been. You know, I think my parents worked incredibly hard to give me like what they have. And, you know, I went to a great school, had some, I have a great group of friends and yeah, I'd say like the, the, the biggest thing I've dealt with kind of setbacks and tough times and uncertain times is just having some perspective. Like my tough times, I was sat in Hong Kong in one of the like this beautiful city, like had great friends. I was living with a really good mate of mine, like life could be worse, you know. Um, and I think that's the, the kind of thing I've just carried with myself um, a long time. I think I, it kind of stems from my parents took me on a trip to Kenya when I was like 15 and I kind of saw how happy those kids were with such little around them. And I think I've just carried that with me everywhere. Like every time I kind of come into a, a place where I start to feel sorry for myself, I'm like, oh mate, just get on with it. Like it's, it's really not that bad. It could always be way worse. So um, yeah, I think that's perspective would be my one. That That's an incredible bit of perspective and that's a really mature view and yet again we're back to travel helping you develop the person you've become mm, yeah massively and i think that's probably one thing my parents would say to me and one of my main bits of feedback from rugby was always i needed to grow up a little bit when i was younger and um not just in the the way i i played but obviously probably my professional behaviors as well was probably a little bit immature probably a bit too laid back probably thought that i could just kind of rock up and and, and do whatever i want um but that's definitely not the way I think now. And I think that's down to me kind of, yeah, traveling around and, and kind of having to learn learn on my own, um, which is, you know, it's put me where I am today and I'm, I'm pretty happy where I'm at. Yeah, you've shown a lot of independence. Are there any, you don't have to name names here, are there any boys giving you a phone saying, you know, is there a chance? Are you able to get me in? Is, what, what's it like in the States? There must have been people fishing. I've lost count, mate. <laughs> a lot of a lot of boys um, from all over the world um i wish it was that simple i wish i could help them all and, and get them in but it's that's i think that's the other thing that's like i think they kind of miss the perception of the league and think that oh i can just talk to the head coach but yeah this guy's a good bloke get him in it's not like that it's you know it's pretty professional very straight up um so i was just like look you're gonna have to just get your agent um 
to get in touch and I can if they ask me for a reference I'll obviously give you a good reference but that's that's all I can do for you mate I'm sorry but um yeah it's just it is what it is it's 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 going to be a harder league every year to get into I think um especially the top teams that have you know the the that produce the lifestyle as well you know because that's such a massive part of it you obviously love playing at home uh you know San Diego getting 8000 regularly but <coughs> Where else do you enjoy playing? You know, you mentioned New England obviously being the rivals, but is there a is there a city you went to and you sort of walked out and pinched yourself a little bit, thinking, "Hang on, I'm playing for San Diego in this place against this team." Yeah, um, in Chicago when we went there, we went in there. It was just the start of summer, and what a city! It was beautiful. It was so good. Um, I really liked it there. Austin, although they're not a team anymore, when I went there last season, it was awesome. Really loved Austin. Had a brilliant night out in Austin after the game. It was phenomenal. I think all we all got told that we had to go around in twos and threes just in case we didn't get shot. But it was a it was a bloody good night out. Um, and then next year, I'm really looking forward to hopefully. I know we're playing New York away, which would be cool. I'm gonna actually go on a little trip to New York in November with a few boys. But um, playing away in New York will be cool. Uh, I know they're gonna make a couple of big signings next year, and um, some big names. And then Miami. Uh, I've also got a team next year, so hopefully we'll get a little away trip to Miami because it's meant to be hectic there, which will be good fun. Yeah, that, that looks incredible. Is there a bit of changing room chat when you see a big name signing for a team? Is there a, oh, didn't know he was keen, or d- does that get a bit of air time? We've got enough kind of, like, we've got a lot of the big dogs in the league from different countries that will kind of get a whiff of it before, so a lot of us kind of, know before it happens or before it announces and set etc so yeah i would be keeping an eye on the mlr for next season there's going to be some surprise uh big dogs playing in there that's all i'll say otherwise yeah. i might get in trouble i don't know <laughs> yeah i'm not surprised at all because it just looks like it's growing and growing it's obviously growing how do you find it though walking down the the high street in san diego does anybody have a clue what's going well, on is yeah, is there... this is the thing that we've found that this year, sorry, this is the thing we found really weird this year. Like we've um, pretty much every Saturday we go out for breakfast at the same spot. We go for a, a beach swim and then go for breakfast. And then when we've got a home game, sorry, not just a Saturday, but any home game and whatever day it is. And every time we have people coming up to us being like, oh, you guys play for Legion. Like we're coming to the game today. And like San Diego is massive. Like we live probably a good 25 minutes away from Snapdragon where we play. Um but I've, I, I think I only missed one home game, and I was around the stadium and doing a little coaching clinic, and and was and just around the buzz, and it's it's actually incredible how many people are there and how much they know about you and how much they want to come and talk to you and get pictures of you and the little kids kind of like copying. There's a lot of us with mullets in the team, like kids copying you with mullets, and they'll print your 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 face on their t-shirts and things like that, like crazy stuff. But for us. That are kind of like nobodies in, in the rugby world are a bit like what is going on like this is hectic which is kind of takes me back to the way americans do sport like they don't care that you're not a lebron james or anything like that if they like you they like you and they, they want to they want to follow you and they want to support you so um yeah it's pretty cool it's very cool yeah and anyone that's been the american sport will get this i mean the word fan is fanatical that they are fanatical about their sport in the states you must have had chances to go and watch some of the other sports while you've been there. Yeah, I went to, uh, um, we, for one of our bye weeks, we and a couple of boys went to Arizona, which was a very fun trip. It was a lot of fun. Uh, if you've not been to Scottsdale, Arizona, with a group of your mates and do it. Um, so we did that. And then while we were there, we went and watched the Phoenix Suns play against the 49ers in the NBA. And it was like 100 quid for a standing seat up in the nosebleeds. Free beers, though, so that was good um so we we absolutely tanked into that for the for that weekend and it was phenomenal like the atmosphere was incredible and you kind of understand why those guys get paid what they do i mean that wasn't i think that was just a regular season game and filled out people going mental um obviously the cheapest tickets expensive so it was it was good um i've been to a a baseball game we've got the padres in, in san diego um again it's a good like day drinking kind of thing but it's it's a pretty boring sport. Um, I think it's like a thirty percent hit rate with when the guy's throwing the ball or pitching the ball and hitting it. So it's pretty boring to watch, but good little date spot if you fancy that as well. 
<laughs> We're getting a real insight into Josh Henderson now. The guard has come down. Uh, when you're <laughs> looking at that, is has your owner got any desire to match up with the Padres or you know <coughs> any other sports and try and get a bit of crossover? I'm not sure. Um, I know. There is some plans and rumors going around that we're moving training facility and it's going to be like this massive shared training facility between us, the women's soccer team who we share Snapdragon with and an MLS team's just been signed to San Diego as well um, for 2025. So there's rumors that we're going to be tra- sharing this massive training facility. And, you know, women's soccer is enormous in America. They, we've, our stadium we play in is like 35,000. I think our biggest crowd was like 12 and a half, 13. They sell out. Like they sell out, they they get thirty five thousand at games, and I think that's partially because like the the players they have, they've got Alex Morgan, who's like the Ronaldo of American women's football, so that attracts a lot of spectators, mainly male, I think. But um, you've also got the the MLS team coming in twenty twenty five, so you're gonna have like Messi coming to play at Snapdragon, so that's gonna attract people as well. So I think he's trying to, I mean, he'd be silly not to, but he's a very very smart man, so he'll be, I'm sure, he'll be getting our teeth and mixed in with those two teams as well to to grow to grow our uh, our brand yeah the women's national team have crashed out the world cup which hasn't yeah, gone down too a um, couple of this, the wave girls playing in that san diego wave girls playing in that so it's a shame yeah it's and the fallout of it's massive that you probably couldn't imagine in women's team sport in this country so it's it's quite an interesting thing to watch you've played rugby in Scotland, Hong Kong, Aussie, and America, where rugby's not really the main gig in town. You know, you, you mentioned rugby league in Australia. Rugby union's a pretty poor little brother to, to rugby league. Have you quite enjoyed that, that you've then just been able to be Josh and not necessarily under a microscope? Yeah, I love that. I think that's, that's the biggest, probably, I think, to be honest, I probably played my best rugby there as well. And I wasn't even playing 10, I was playing fullback um but i i just felt like so free and just kind of like look i can i can do my thing i make sure i'm prepared for the weekend train tuesday thursday night um turn up on the saturday and, and just have fun and it was very like because i turned up so late in the season um i was kind of not there was no expectation of me i just kind of like go out and play and and do your thing and i loved it although we fell short at the end um i, I still absolutely love my time there and and I, and I do enjoy playing fullback as well as 10. Like 10, 10 is obviously my favourite position and I like kind of steering the ship. But um, if I get the opportunity to play fullback, I, I, I like that as well. So playing in Oz and boys were just chucking the ball around, like it's almost offensive to kick the ball away there. So it's, it was good. It was good fun. And then you go to America, and again, it's it's not a big deal. It made me laugh that you sort of commented on baseball there because probably baseball fans would come to rugby and go, "What the hell is going on here?" Has there yeah. been has there been some attempt to convert people? You know, they obviously love live sport. Rugby's complicated, but they're obviously trying really hard to get the match day experience to be something that <coughs> Americans yeah. are going to sign up for. Yeah, the one thing I reckon, and I'm talking to a lot of fans, I try and make a good effort when I'm walking around to, like, almost be like, "Oh, look, is there anything you didn't understand?" Like, just just ask. Like, and they've been told that they can ask us questions whenever, even if they see us out. So, we're more than happy to answer and, and help out. And they just love violence. Americans just love violence. Like, they they don't really care that they don't know the rules. They just want to turn up and see. Like, they think we're all insane. Like, if you meet someone and they've had a couple of drinks, they're more than happy to ask if like, we're all right. Like if we're like psychologically all right, cause they just don't understand why we're playing a contact sport without pads on. They just don't, they just can't calculate it in their brain. And they think that I, I explain it. They probably think about how we think about cage fighters. We think, why are you doing that? It's crazy. Like that's how they look at us. They're like, you guys are insane. Like, what are you doing? Um, which is kind of good. I'm not used to having that kind of hard man persona, but they give it to me. <laughs> Yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> I'll <laughs> we'll take, take it all day. Take it all day. <laughs> so you obviously had that massive season and then it didn't finish the way you wanted it to. So I assume, and you <coughs> mentioned it about winning back-to-back championships, it's all guns blazing for this year to, to take that trophy. Yeah, I think what we did this year and a lot of the feedback that it's kind of been circling around is 
we started so well and we're just thrashing everyone that we kind of took our foot off the gas a little bit, started squad rotating a little bit and, and resting guys and, and then coming into playoffs, changing game plans and things like that, which is like, that's not just the coaching group, that's the playing group. Like we're, there's a group of us that are, that are leaders in that sense. And, um, and I think that's just what we got wrong. I think we, we kind of got overconfident because we were just, even games we played badly, we're still winning and, and winning comfortably. Um, so, you know, like I said, I think we've learned our last lesson there and we, we know that, you know, we're going to learn a lot of li lots of little lessons, but I think that's our one last big lesson that we need to learn to become like, you know, a bit, a bit of a beast. Um, and that's what a lot of the senior players are saying. It's like, yeah, okay, look, well done, New England, all good, but um, you kind of you create a beast now and we're, we're going to come for, for everything for the next five, ten years. So the, the culture then, you're playing poorly, but you were still winning. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd we point towards a reasonably positive culture and then probably just a little bit dazzled into that final game, but that's only going to add to that culture that you've said is pretty positive. Yeah, hugely. And um, I think like a big, one thing I learned this year from a lot of the older guys that they kept saying was like a big indication of culture is how good your defense is, because a lot of it's just grit and how hard you prepare to work for your mate. And, um, I think we had the best defense in the league this year. So, um, and in terms of that, that that says a lot. It sings sings a lot about our team and and what we're prepared to do for each other. Prepared, prepared to put our body on the line, and that's that's one to fifteen. You know, we're as a as a as a kind of playmaking group. We put a lot of onus on ourselves, not being that kind of cliche nine and ten and being soft and D. We we wanted to defend at the seam and and make sure if boys were coming down there, they were getting hit. So that's something that we got held accountable by by the rest of the team as well, which is something I've never had before either. Um, you know, I think in the past, I've probably had a, a reputation when I was younger for not, not being the best of defenders, but I definitely wouldn't say that about myself now because, and I think it, it was something as simple as, you know, I want to do it for my mates and I'm, I'm not wanting to let my mates down. So um, that's another great learning for me this year and something I'll be taking into next year as well. So that's something that you feel was a slight previously, but now isn't. Does that say a lot for you being in the right place where you feel happy? Yeah, I mean, I think I think anyone will tell you, not about just rugby, but anything. If you're off the field, if you're happy, like you're going to be your best version of yourself, and and whether that means you need to be down the beach every day or whatever, like I'm not going to go into too much detail about what people need to be happy, but um, for me, I think it's just the environment. I mean, if I feel like I'm learning and I'm I'm developing, um, then I'm I'm happy. Um, that's all I need. So, um, and the sun, and the sun, I need the sun as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's not much jealousy coming from this side about that. But so you, you've wandered far. I doubt you're going to be able to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Looking into the crystal ball, where are you in ten years' time? Yeah, it's a tough one. I think. I've got another three years left on my deal at the moment, or two plus one, two years plus one more year on, on my deal at the moment. Um, I definitely want to see that out just with everything uh, that they've done for me. And I want to kind of repay their investment uh, on me and, and bring them championships and make sure I'm a big part of that. Um, but also, like I, I touched on, I think I'm, I'm really happy where I am and the environment I'm in. Um, like Encinitas, where I live, North County, San Diego is one of the most beautiful parts in California. Um, so I, it's going to be hard to drag me away from there. I'll be very surprised if I'm not there in 10 years' time is what I'll say. Oh, that's cool. I don't know if your mum's going to be overly impressed with that answer, but... Uh... Uh, she gets a trip out every year. It's fine. Uh, okay. So when you said that mum dragged you home, you know, it's always going to be home where you are just now. But San Diego beginning to feel like that too? Yeah, I was. She, yeah, she didn't drag me home. She was just like, "Oh, we've well, not been home in three years." Like grandparents and stuff. I was like, "Okay, yeah, fair enough." Maybe guilt tripped me a little bit. I know that's what that's the proper word for it. But um, yeah, no. To be honest, I actually had to check myself on the group chat with my mates the other day because I was like, oh, "I'm heading home in two weeks," and the boys like, "Home?" And I was like, "Well, yeah." To be fair, I think it is. Like I'm pretty settled there. I can't see myself moving anywhere else or um, or coming back here anytime soon. So. Um, yeah, no, I think I think it is becoming home. 
That's cool. I like that. I think that's a pretty decent one to wrap up on. I've absolutely loved speaking to you, Josh. Uh, Mate, I didn't happen. know you. I didn't. I didn't know you. I know your old man, as I said, but I, I love the positivity and the the mature outlook you've got. But it's come from learning and travel. So I did. I did tell you this was going to happen. I'm really interested to hear what you're going to say here. So for me, happiness is egg shaped. For you, Josh, happiness is time to do whatever you want. That's oh. what I reckon. Like enough it. time to, enough time to do whatever you want that's happening nice well i think you've still got plenty of time you've still got plenty of time josh been class chatting to you thank you so much and hopefully i'll i'll see you in the flesh at some point soon yeah mate thank you thanks for having me appreciate it thank yeah. you absolutely brilliant Love that. What an absolutely top man. Uh, so much in it. And I love that he's just taking opportunities no matter where they are. It's been the right thing for him. Packs his bag and off he goes. And I'm now a pretty big San Diego fan, I reckon. I want to see him go and, go and smash it. If you enjoyed it, you can listen to us on Apple Acast and Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. You can watch on Facebook and YouTube. Leave us a review. Tell your friends. Spread the word. The Happiness is podcast is back and hopefully there are many many more to come thank you very much for listening and in the meantime look after yourself my name is bruce hitson from the happiness is podcast and my happiness is egg shaped hello all happiness is egg shaped listeners and watchers this is the happiness is podcast with me your host bruce hitson brought to you in association with infinity blue they can look after you whether it is a checkup teeth whitening or a more complicated procedure. Give them a call, get in touch, and they will look after you to make sure that you keep that smile intact. Because after all, they know, we know, I know, you know, happiness is egg-shaped.